So today I have the distinct honor to introduce our second keynote speaker for the Winship Symposium, Dr. Otis Brawley. Dr. Brawley is Professor of Oncology and the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins University. He also serves as the Associate Director for Community and Outreach, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied today, for Community Outreach and Engagement for the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center. Dr. Brawley is a globally recognized expert in cancer prevention and control. His research is focused on developing cancer screening strategies and ensuring their effectiveness. Dr. Brawley currently leads a broad interdisciplinary research effort on health disparities that strives to close racial, economic, and social disparities in the prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer in the US. Dr. Brawley has a deep understanding of the Winship catchment area and the entire state of Georgia after spending almost 20 years on the faculty of Emory um, and in the Atlanta area. We so wish that we could have welcomed Dr. Brawley back to Atlanta in person today, um, but since that's not possible, we're thrilled to see him on Zoom. So today, uh, Dr. Brawley will join us um, in presenting on cancer control in the 21st century. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Otis Brawley. Hello, uh, can you hear me? We can. Great, great, great. It, it's really a pleasure to be here talking to you and it's actually good that I'm following uh, uh, some docs that I really, really love. I mean, some, uh, some of the uh, characters you have there at the Winship Cancer Institute are just absolutely amazing physicians, scientists and human beings and folks that I really respect. And so with that ado, I'm going to talk about cancer control in the 21st century and talk a little bit about disparities and about how a number of things are changing over time. Some of the definitions that uh, we use are changing. And indeed, this morning, the American Medical Association released its statement on race and on how we need to get away from some of the markers that we've used in the past. And I'll talk about that, actually. These are my uh, disclosures. A few years ago, I wrote a best-selling book, and I still make some money off of it in royalties, so I should discuss that or disclose that. I'm going to talk about trends in cancer death over the past three decades, define race and population categorization, which is really important if we want to get really scientific and then define disparities in the 21st century. The definition is changing. I'm going to talk a little about Georgia as we do this and discuss some of the uh, uh, approaches to overcoming disparities. This is the number of deaths in 2019 from various causes of disease. I point this out because uh, coronavirus didn't exist in 2019. And in 2020, when we published the 2020 uh, numbers, coronavirus will be number three between cancer and accidents. And actually, if you want to look at it on a daily or weekly basis, later this year, uh, coronavirus will be number two, the second leading cause of cancer, uh, second leading cause of death, uh, killing more people than cancer and almost rivaling heart disease. Hopefully it won't get to the point of uh, surpassing heart disease. Now, cardiovascular death rates have been declining over the last 40 years, cancer death rates have been declining as well. I'll show you that in a second. Heart disease death rates are declining faster than cancer death rates. And we estimate that within the next five to 10 years, the leading cause of death in the United States will be cancer followed by heart disease. Uh, this is death rates in the United States over the 20th century. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist and a medical oncologist, so I apologize for showing you numbers and data. In 1900, uh, the population saw 64 deaths for every 100,000 deaths. That, this is age adjusted as if the population in 1900 had the age distribution of the population in 2000. Uh, by 1991, the age adjusted death rate had risen to 215 per 100,000, and it has now gone down by 2017 to 152. And there's been a 29% decline in age-adjusted death rate or risk of death in the United States 
from 1991 to 2017. The 2018 data is just coming out right now. I have a little 2018 data in a second. This is the death rate using the racial and ethnic categories that you can see on the bottom left of the slide. These are the definitions given to us by the Office of Management and Budget at the White House. You can see Blacks have had the greatest decline, but they had the highest point to come from. Whites have had a decline. Native Americans have not had much of a decline, but they actually had a death rate lower than whites. Uh, Hispanics and Asian Pacific Islanders have a death rate even lower than Native Americans. So by race, there is some difference. Now, I noted earlier, the Office of Management and Budget in the White House defines what race is in the United States, and they define ethnicity. There are two ethnicities, according to them, Hispanic and non-Hispanic. And these are the racial categorizations. As of 2000, they actually started accepting the fact that there was admixture, mixed races uh, for the census, as well as, by the way, these are the definitions that must be used in all federal documents, including NIH applications, fun, uh, requests for funding for research and so forth. The problem is the OMB says these are sociopolitical and not biological definitions. Uh, indeed, the concept of race for biology has been rejected by the anthropologic community as non-scientific, and indeed, race changes over time. When I say that, people born in India who lived in the United States in 1960 were considered Caucasian. By 1970, they were considered Asian Pacific Islander. Now they're in a category called Asian. They've been three different categories over the last 60 years. Barack Obama was white in 1970 and black in 1980, according to the OMB definitions. These are very non-scientific. Now there's been a lot of discussion about diversity in clinical trials. Uh, we have to be careful. Much, not all of this discussion is political and not scientific. Indeed, the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993 calls for these valid subset analyses. But subset analyses need to be done very cautiously because they are not statistically significant by nature. Uh, clinical trials participation should be encouraged by minorities, however, uh, especially since participation in NCI-sponsored trials has been shown to give someone a greater assurance of high-quality care. And as you'll see later in the talk, getting minorities high-quality care has been a real problem. There's a large number of especially poor people who get less than high quality care. Now, race is not biological categorization. It is a sociopolitical construct. And those of you who've been, been involved with uh, Ancestry.com or 23andMe, now they use ancestry or area of geographic origin. These are more biological. Uh, race is incredibly broad. Area of geographic origin is more specific and scientific, but admixture does complicate things. When we look at Black or African and talk about ancestry, there are 109 different areas of geographic origin or regions in Africa that are currently recognized. Here are some of them. And when we talk about admixture, I am part of the first six, in addition to six European organizations, uh, European areas of, uh, of origin. I am 12 different areas of origin, me personally. By the way, in Europe or Caucasians, there are 840 areas of geographic origin. Here's some of the other breakdowns. As we learn more about anthropology, the number of areas of geographic origin actually increase. Now, let me give you some examples of how area of geographic origin is important for science and as a scientific categorization. Uh, there are a number of forms of G6PD deficiency in various areas of geographic origin. My favorites, the HLA-B1502 allele is found in about 20% of people who live within 100, 150 kilometers, 100 miles to 150 kilometers of the Tiber-Burmese border. 20% of people on either side of that border. If you give them Tegretol, the anti-seizure medicine, 
and they have this allele, they develop a Stevens-Johnson reaction, 20%. This is 20% of people who live along the Thai Burmese border. This is not 20% of people in Thailand. It's not 20% of people in Asia, which is the racial categorization. It is a marker of an area of geographic origin. The other thing, the sickle cell mutation has a prevalence amongst people originating in southern Greece, southern Italy, going into the Middle East, and then higher prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa. People who originate from South Africa do not get sickle cell disease. I've described white people who get it and black people who don't. Anyone in South Africa who has sickle cell, and there's a lot of sickle cell in South Africa, they are migrants from up north or their relatives are migrants from up north. These are all markers of area of geographic origin. In the case of sickle cell disease, it's a marker of an area of uh, malaria. Now, as we move into cancer control in the 21st century, we have to keep these uh, definitions in mind. And we have to remember that as we develop these new tailored drugs, we're not gonna use large phase three studies anymore. We're gonna use 30 to 50 person phase two clinical trials that are aimed at very specific genomic targets. And these drugs will have certain metabolism by certain various enzymes. We need to learn about the drugs, its targets and its way of metabolism. And we need to tailor these trials to people who will benefit or people who will not be harmed. We need to look at who's going on in these trials very, very carefully and keep that in mind. It's not, by the way, whether or not tamoxifen works in blacks or whites, it's whether or not the woman has estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that we need to be concerned about. I use that because that's a very old example of a targeted drug. Now, I showed you a 29% decline in mortality. That's due to wise early detection, and there is unwise early detection, improvements in cancer treatment, as well as prevention, especially tobacco control. When I say wise early detection, there are examples of how screening can be beneficial. There are also examples of how screening can actually kill. And screening, in the case of lung cancer screening, in some poor resource, poor hospitals can actually uh, distract resources from other things, be it treatment of people with non-cancerous conditions, breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening. As resources go into lung cancer screening, it can actually increase disparities. So we support lung cancer screening in a area or hospital or a setting where the resources are available to support it. Certainly at Emory, it can be supported. Now, uh, the, uh, we need to follow good science. I am a big fan of cancer prevention. We have underemphasized prevention in the United States. As I said earlier, the majority of uh, the biggest cause of cancer, not the majority of the biggest cause of cancer right now is tobacco use. Number two is really the combination of overweight, obesity, diet, and lack of exercise. Bad diet, too many calories. Okay, it's a three-legged stool. Too many calories, not burning them off enough, and then over storage. 30% of cancers right now are due to energy balance. And then hereditary factors, viruses, alcohol, UV and ionizing radiation. Uh, about 2% of cancers today are due to medical radiation, x-rays, nuclear medicine scans. Screening can be harmful. We have to be very careful of that. Uh, reproductive factors and pollution. This is tobacco usage. Those of us who do not have gray hair in the audience may not be aware that in 1955, 55% of adult men, many doctors, smoke cigarettes. In 1965 was the peak for women at 35%, and it has declined ever since. And we're now in the realm of 16% uh, of uh, women smoking, 17% of men. Tobacco use still a leading cause of death, uh, leading cause of cancer and cancer death, but will not in the, be in the future. Here's actually those percentages in terms of people smoking. No. Race is a socio-political construct, and there are 
racial differences in smoking use. Uh, and there can even be regional differences. This 24% among Native American females is true. That's not a typo. But if you go to New Mexico and Arizona, the Native Americans there, none of the men or women smoke. If you go to the plains, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, high smoking rates among Native Americans, actually higher than these numbers. So it can be tremendous variance, but there are differences in smoking by sociopolitical categorization. Very important to the United States, there are differences in smoking by educational attainment. Notice people who are very educated don't smoke. This also is not a typo. Something about people who are high school dropouts who end up going back and getting their high school diploma, those are driven people. Now, this is a map of the United States and this is cigarettes uh, in the lifetime or currently smoke. Notice these states. This is a pattern you're gonna see a lot in the last third of the talk here. These are the states with the highest cigarette usage. Uh, Utah, California have the lowest uh, tobacco use. Uh, liver cancer is a problem, 50% due to HCV or HBV. Uh, viruses of uh, HPV, this is growing in the population. HPV is now linked to six different cancers. It's not just cervix cancer anymore, but head and neck cancer is taking off big. Talked about energy balance already and talked about the problem with energy balance and how it's growing into the future. This is more an American problem than any place else. Just looking at obesity here, remember it's Obesity, too many calories, and not enough exercise. Just looking at obesity, 15% or so of adults were obese in 1970 in the United States. It's well over 35% now. And you can see what other countries are doing in terms of obesity. Most are on a rise, but they're not nearly where the United States is. This is a huge racial problem in the United States, especially for black women and Hispanic women. This just shows you black women, 60% or more are obese. This is obesity. This is not overweight. If you do obesity plus overweight, more than 80% of adult black women are either obese or overweight. And you can see rise for everyone, but in black women, it's been a special rise. Now let's look at a couple of cancers, breast cancer. And these are the American Cancer Society statistics for numbers diagnosed and death. Most importantly, there's been a 40% decline in age-adjusted mortality from 1990 to 2016. About 40 to 60% of that is due to screening. When we look at black-white, there's seven states where there's no black-white mortality difference, six because the states have very low breast cancer death rates, and one, West Virginia, because uh, black and white women have very high breast cancer death rates. When we look at the trends from 1975 onward, black death rate, white death rate, note in breast cancer, the death disparity is greater today than it has ever been. Here you can see the other three racial ethnic groups. We started collecting data on them in 1990. Now this is disparities by race or ethnicity as defined by OMB. This is disparities by state. Uh, the, we started out very homogeneously in the 1980s and then we started having improvements in breast cancer death rates. I noted a 40% decline in the US as a whole. It's 20 to 29% in the purple states, 44 to 51% in the dark blue states. Uh, we've been talking about disparities by race, black, white. We're going to start talking more about Massachusetts versus Mississippi as we go off into the future, the 20% decline versus the 51% decline. And why? By the way, there's a huge emphasis on screen, screen, screen. Mary Jo Lund, when she was at the School of Public Health at Emory, noted that about 7% of black women who have screen detected localized breast cancer get no treatment after the diagnosis. They had access for a biopsy, but they got no treatment within two years of the diagnosis. 
Now that's research that we learned about 120 years ago and they're not getting today. Um, Jeannie Mandelblatt in the CISNET program showed that uh, looking at women who die of breast cancer, failure to follow accepted screening guidelines accounted for about 10% of all breast cancer deaths. Failure to get adequate treatment was somewhere between 21 and 27% of those 45,000 or so breast cancer deaths per year. The failure to get people adequate care matters a hell of a lot more than failure to screen. Look at colon cancer. These are the ACS colon cancer statistics for colorectal cancer. There's been a 50% decline in age-adjusted colon cancer deaths uh, since 1980. Here you can see the decline for black uh, women versus white women, the other groups. Here you can see the decline for black men versus white men and the other groups. That 40% decline. This is uh, actually something we put together when I was at the American Cancer Society to support the concept that insurance matters. The dotted lines are people who are uninsured. Blue is stage two red is stage one. And this just shows, you know, stage, stage two with private insurance, five-year survival is better than stage one without insurance or people who got Medicaid as soon as they were diagnosed. They did not have Medicaid for prevention. Insurance matters as to, even if stage four, the insured live a more higher percentage of life at five years than the uninsured. Now I talked about the 50%, the having of the colorectal death rate in the United States since 1980, uh, not homogenous. Now, it was in 1980, but here, 63% decline in Massachusetts, the dark blue 55 to 63%, the purple again, 12 to 31%. This Notice the purple always seems to be the same states. This is a problem in getting people adequate treatment differences in prevalence of screening, quality of screening. By the way, this is too, uh, too, too much to talk about right now, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. There's evidence that, cert that blacks or poor people get their colon cancer treated in hospitals where the pathologists don't have as much time to analyze the PATH package compared to whites. And some of the what black people have more aggressive colon cancer than whites is simply because the blacks are not adequately staged. Higher proportion of blacks with less than adequate staging for colon cancer compared to whites. In result of that social injustice is we end up deciding it's proof that colon cancer is more aggressive in blacks than whites. Need to improve quality. Prostate cancer, I just, point this out. Uh, this is uh, death rate per 100,000 uh, for whites. Rural Georgia, a high in the country of 22.3, a low in the country in Detroit at 16.1 per 100,000. Blacks in uh, Los Angeles, 45. Blacks in uh, New Mexico, almost where whites in Georgia are at 21. We have uh, huge disparities in these outcomes we need to address. Now, lung cancer, these are the ACS numbers, not about 154,000 who die every year. This is mortality. I showed you smoking earlier today. Uh, this is really, mortality today is a map of smoking 30 to 40 years ago. Again, these are the states. Look at, um, uh, we need to start thinking about state by state disparities. Kentucky at 125 deaths per 100,000. I'm sorry, Kentucky at 195 versus Utah at 125. Uh, I've already told you my concerns about lung cancer screening. This was a study that Emory was a part of. It showed that screening works when it's done in 30 of the finest hospitals in the country. That same study, however, showed that for every 5.4 lives you save, you put two people in an intensive care unit and one person dies due to the diagnostic procedures due to the screen. By the way, a third of the people who died didn't have lung cancer. Death from 
transbronchial uh, biopsy, death from uh, transthoracic biopsy. Uh, again, 30 of the best hospitals in the country. How does this work when it's done in Columbus, Georgia, or done uh, in Valdosta, Georgia, at smaller hospitals? We don't think it's going to be 5.4 lives for every one life saved. Uh, ACS did some, did some calculations. We think that if we screened everybody the way those people were screened with the quality of the 30 hospitals that did this in the original study, we would save eight to 10,000 deaths per year from lung cancer and kill 1,500 to 1,850 people. You have to be very careful. This is why six respected organizations have called for informed decision-making amongst people who have good high quality lung cancer screening and treatment available to them. How can we provide adequate high quality care is really, really an important question. And unnecessary care uh, can actually increase disparities and state by state disparities are increasing. These are the states in orange that have not uh, expanded Medicaid so that people 18 to 65 can qualify for Medicaid if they can't get other insurances. The states in dark blue have, the states in light blue are in the process. Again, this keeps this pattern keeps showing up. These are the states that are gonna have the greater disparities compared to the states in blue as we go forward. Now I'm gonna end with just three more slides. The true cost of disparities. As I left the American Cancer Society in 2018, we set out to define disparities in the United States. How many people, who are they, where are they? How we did that is we noted that college educated people have a much lower risk of death than non-college educated people. Indeed, giving a college education to a black man lowers his risk of dying from cancer more than giving him white skin would be. Uh, it is estimated that about 600,000 Americans will die from cancer this year. And that's an American Cancer Society estimate. If all those Americans had the death rate of college educated Americans, 22% or 132,000 would not die. More than one in five cancers would go away if everybody had what college educated Americans have. This is not a New treatment, no breakthrough treatment has ever saved 132,000 people a year. This is just giving people what we already know exists, the whole spectrum, prevention, diagnosis and screening, as well as treatment. Just get it out to everybody. Now, of course, you have to get things like smoking cessation to this population 40, 50 years ago, but this is why prevention is actually incredibly important. Now, that 132,000 people, they live in every state, but they tend to be a higher prevalence of them in the South. That's number one. And number two, the majority of that 132,000, 80,000 are white Americans. The biggest disparate population in the United States are white Americans and not black. Now, I started in minority health and health disparities 30 years ago, and we only talked about black-white differences. We didn't talk about poor and social ethnic minorities uh, of whom poor people, their largest poor people, group of poor people in the country are actually whites who live in the Southern United States. So the control of cancer should focus on disease prevention and getting people good basic care, um, good basic care to include screening as well as treatment. Uh, so last words, Population disparities always increase when there's progress in medicine. Notice the black-white disparity in colon and breast cancer occurred as we learn how to screen and treat for those diseases. Uh, and then uh, it's going to occur with immunotherapy and other new precision medicines. Uh, prevention rarely causes the disparities I'm talking about. There are no disparities in smallpox by race or socioeconomics, because we have good prevention. There's certain populations that need a little bit more than others to get to where we all want to be. Some of the times those populations will be poor whites in rural Georgia, 
Uh, sometimes those populations will be poor Blacks in Southeast Atlanta. And this is my new home. Thank you for uh, tolerating my talk.